I don't really think of myself as working on collective human intelligence, so I'm going to put that in parentheses. Um, but I think it's just central to the way we in cognitive science think about human intelligence, that it's fu fundamentally a social and collective activity. And so I'm going to focus on parts of the research program in our group that lay the, that I think um, are general, but lay the foundations for distinctively human forms of collective intelligence. Um, it's also great to come after the previous two talks, which were both brilliant talks um, and very inspiring to me, and from people whose work has long been inspiring to me. And I think you'll see many common themes, including the themes about uh, program induction and probabilistic programs that Melanie mentioned, but also some of the general themes about what it really means to be intelligent that, and, and problem solving that Maha talked about. Another key part of our work is that it really sits between cognitive science and the engineering of machine forms of intelligence. We think that under, understanding human intelligence in what we like to call reverse engineering terms in computational mathematical and computational um, models can is, 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 is the preferred way to understand human intelligence, but also lays the foundations for building more human-like forms of intelligence in machines. And I think in the collective setting for thinking about how to make machines genuine thought partners, or at least knowledge creation and understanding partners with humans. Like Melanie, I think it, I often like to reflect on the current state of AI and to try to think about the gap between today's AI technologies, which are very impressive and consist of, I would say, various systems and, and more systems all the time that do things that we used to think only humans could do. And in some cases, they even enhance our collective intelligence. Um, I, I won't comment further on cases where they fail to or undermine our collective intelligence. But we have to be mindful in any case of the gaps between these technologies and what you could call real AI, the things that motivated the founders of the field um, that I think, you know, if we talk about the notion of intelligence that Maha started off with, it's, ex it's exactly the same notion, right? True understanding um, that enables humans to do each and every one of these activities for themselves and to create new activities. And what enables us to build knowledge together. And if we had AI that, that had that kind of intelligence, then um, I think that could be the kind of AI that could build knowledge jointly with humans. But fundamentally, what we have is technologies that have been mostly driven by pattern recognition and function approximation, whether it's deep learning in uh, or learning in deep neural networks or other forms of machine learning that have advanced over the last several decades. And ha the field hasn't really um, made nearly as much progress on what I think is the heart of intelligence that goes back to the early days of the field and is core in cognitive science. And what I think animates many of us in this community here, which are all the ways that we um, understand the world by building models, mental models of the external world, of our own minds, of other people's minds, and the things that we can do together. So our ways of actually explaining and understanding our sense data, not just uh, finding patterns in it and our ability to imagine things that maybe we haven't seen, to make those goals so that we can plan actions and solve problems to make those things real. That's intelligent. And then intelligent learning is about building new models, learning from both our successes as well as our failures, and doing this in a collective sense by sharing models. A lot of what we learn, so much of what we learn as humans, we didn't discover for ourselves, but rather we learn from knowledge that accumulates across generations, even across different cultures. So, you know, well, I think it's fair to say that we haven't made nearly as much progress on these aspects of intelligence, I, that, I, that's what I'm inspired to do. And in, in our work, we are particularly take a developmental approach. We think about what is, in a sense, AI's oldest dream. What would it take to build a machine that could grow into intelligence the way a person does, that starts like a baby and learns like a child, right? This may not be the only way to make uh, a human-like forms of AI. But I think it's our best bet, because if you think about it, a human child is really the only example we have in the known universe of a learning machine that reliably grows into full human intelligence, starting from much less. And if we could make even small steps of progress towards building that kind of AI, it would be, I think, incredibly useful and also uh, you know, powerful in, in potentially dangerous ways. But it's, it's the, the kind of dream that AI has hoped for, but also what would really lay the foundations for better under understanding where our own intelligence comes from. So the key questions in this approach is really what do we start with and how do we learn the rest? And so this is what I mean by the cognitive and computational foundation. Okay. 
understand. Um, in terms of what we start with, I'm very inspired by the work of developmental psychologists such as Elizabeth Spelke, Susan Carey, Renee Byer Jean, and others who've identified systems of core knowledge that are present in some form, even in the youngest baby that you can study experimentally, like three month old babies, and then develop in systematic ways over the first year or two of life and become not, they, they are not the sole basis of our common sense in adulthood, but they're the foundations on which other forms of later developing cognition built. So I mean things like our systems for understanding objects, their physical properties and their interaction, space and time, a kind of intuitive physics, like what you see in this child here or any child playing with blocks or stacking of cups or anything like that, right? Abilities for grasping objects, not just with their hands, but with their minds, and then making plans such as stacking up a stack of three cups. This kid here is in the middle of making a stack of two that he's going to put on a stack of three. And that's just part of a plan he has. We'll just sort of get to the point after he's debugged a few problems that have come up along the way. He's built a stack. He keeps going all the way until he builds a, a tall tower. We've made great progress in humanoid robotics, but we have nothing like a robot that can conceive of this kind of plan and all the steps needed to make it in a, in a, in a general um, not just for cup, but for any number of goals that a, a kid might set for themselves with the physical objects around them. By intuitive psychology, another classic core system, we mean the kind of thing that you can see in this famous experiment by Felix Wernicke and Micah Tomasello, where you have another one and a half year old seeing an action that he's never quite seen before, but being able to, to understand what this adult is doing and why in some form, at least enough to help him so that when the adult stops, the kid goes and does something helpful without fully knowing what's gonna happen. But he opens the cabinet, sees there's a plausible place to put the books and then steps back and expects the adult to put the books inside that. Okay. So think about what has to be going on inside his head as he's watching this action sequence unfold in order to understand what the adult is trying to do and how to help him. He has to have some sense of that uh, other agent's goals or desires, his beliefs, the physical constraints that the closed door presents, and what kind of uh, plans the adult was making and how he might be able to jointly go in and help. So these are the kind of core systems that we wanna to try to understand. We wanna to try to understand in mathematical computational terms. Um, the, uh, the, the next step is the idea of like, how, you know, how do you go beyond that um, is this idea that Melanie was referring to, which I'll talk about a little at the end of the talk, what you could call learning as programming, the idea that not just the systems that I just talked about, but really all of our systems of knowledge, probably the, the, the best candidate we have for universal representation of human knowledge is some kind of code. Um, I don't necessarily mean in familiar programming languages, although increasingly when we're talking about collective cultural intelligence humans, it actually literally is in programming languages, but I mean also our internal languages of thought. And I mean our natural languages like English or any other natural language, which have many of the same kinds of properties in terms of how they express knowledge about the world. And if that's the form of our knowledge, then learning is a kind of programming. And we think about all the ways that um, you know, a human programmer might make their code better or more awesome. Um, and think about those, those all have analogs of learning. This idea was expressed recently in a position paper that Josh Rule and Steve Pianatosi and I published in, in TICS, Trends in Cognitive Science, which we called the child as hacker. And by that hacker, we don't mean like the bad guys who break into your email and steal your credit card numbers, but like the notion that we have around MIT of kind of creative exploration of code or other kinds of systems, engineered systems uh, to uh, achieve self-generated goals and all the kinds of awesomeness that we make by doing that. All right, so how are we going to capture core systems of knowledge in mathematical and engineering terms, or this idea of uh, knowledge as code and learning as program? So here's where the math comes in, and this isn't going to be a very mathematical talk, but I want to point to the mathematics and broadly construed, meaning other kinds of principles of computation and engineering that we can use to try to capture these ideas. So one is the idea of what we call probabilistic programs, which if you're not familiar with these, um, there's a few pointers down here like probmods.org, gen.dev, which are pointers to resources you can read online to learn about these views, at, both from um, basic cognitive modeling as in the probmods.org web book or for engineering AI as in the gen system uh, that was developed at MIT's Publicity Computing Group 
by Vakash Mansinga and Marco Uzumano Town and others. Problemods.org is a web book that I contributed uh, some to, but it's mostly been put together by Noah Goodman and a number of other colleagues. And what you'll see if you explore this, this world is that basically this, these are probabilistic programs are mathematical objects, but also formal systems, uh, software systems that, that you can work with. Um, I'm highlighting a number of them down here also on the lower right that allow us to combine our best ideas on intelligence and, the, and really tapping into the best, to, to the re, uh, differently relevant branches of mathematics that have arisen over the decades of that these fields have existed, going back to our, our both the foundations of cognitive science and AI in the 1950s, where we haven't. I mean, what I think we've we've come to learn as a field that there's that there's value in all of these ideas, but maybe because they have different mathematics or different engineering traditions, it's only it hasn't been until recently that we've had ways to bring them together and really exploit the power that these complementary synergistic ideas can bring to each other. So that means not only neural networks or other, you know, we'll call them differentiable programs, which can be really scaled up using automatic gradient descent methods, and then, uh, you know, applied to big data, pattern recognition, function approximation problems, what's been the, the workhorse of modern deep learning and a lot of AI technologies, but the idea of probabilistic inference or Bayesian inference in causally structured models so that you can observe effects in the world and reason backwards to the underlying causes like the, the intuitive physics, the, the, the physical properties of objects and their physical interaction, or the internal workings of agents' heads, their beliefs and desires or their goals and expectations that, that were responsible that caused the actions you observe. Th that is also a central idea in intelligence. And maybe the best original good idea in intelligence is the idea of symbol manipulation or abstract languages for knowledge representation and reasoning. And if you, if, if you um, are excited and recognize that all of these ideas um, capture parts of intelligence, I think Matt Lenny made a great case for abstraction. Um, I'll show some examples of probabilistic inference. And I think you know, many of us in this community have worked on that. Nobody has to argue for neural networks. But if you want to bring these ideas together, probabilistic programs are at, at the moment our, our best paradigm and tool set for doing that. Now, there's a lot more that you need, like if you want to build models of intuitive physics, that we can do that by doing probabilistic inference over the inputs and outputs of programs. What kind of programs? Well, I'm not going to go into the details on this, but the, the idea, for example, of simulation programs, like those that are embedded in modern game engines for simulating the physical world, like, for example, these cases here, which allow us to simulate, you know, in ways that look good, maybe aren't fully accurate, but, but are accurate enough and very efficient, even for very complex systems like complex multi-body rigid systems or various non-rigid systems. Um, and, and the idea is that some, some kinds of scalable approximate simulators of both the physical world, but also other agents' behavior, as in like what's sometimes called game AI, the non-player character um, perception and planning systems that are built into modern game engines can be the basis, the mathematics and the engineering basis for capturing this cognitive core. The idea that um, in um, when it, you know when it, when this kid here thinks about what's going to happen if I roll this ball towards the stack of blocks, something like running a simulation in a mental physics engine to see what might happen: the blocks might fall over, the bird toy bird on top might fall over, might fall down, um, could be a way to imagine what's going to happen next. And then decide, is that what you want to do? Is that not what you want to do? Use that as part of the planning process. Um, we call this the game engine in the head idea, because in contrast to the way people use simulators like this to train, say, reinforcement learning agents, which then have to get deployed into the real world with some sim to real transfer problem. Here, we're talking about using these simulators as a model, a mathematical model of the mental model in a person's head which become really, they only become tools of intelligence when you wrap them inside frameworks for probabilistic inference and, and learning. Okay. So we've used these tools for, for, for more than 10 years now in our group to build models of intuitive physics, like for example, in blocks world kind of situations where we might ask, will these stack of blocks fall over? Or how far will they fall? Or which way will they fall? Or what happens if one color block is much heavier than another? Or if you see objects which should be falling over, and you know, because they look like they would be unstable, but they're not falling. Can you make an inference that one kind of material is much heavier or lighter than another? And by basically um, 
doing probabilistic prediction as well as probabilistic inverse inference about the underlying parameters of the physics, we can build systems which make these judgments, but also capture very well human judgment. So for example, this, this graph here is showing one of our early experiments um, asking people, how likely is a stack of blocks to fall over or how unstable are blocks like these? And we can take the average human judgments, which are shown on the y-axis, and take our model predictions, which are basically the average of a small number of forward rollouts in a probabilistic physics engine. We take a like Pi Bullet, a game physics engine, and we have the probability comes in because there's uncertainty about, let's say, exactly where the blocks are in 3D, or perhaps exactly what forces are at play. That uncertainty is crucial. I'm not going to go into it here, but the, the model fits depend on having the right kinds of uncertainty. And we these models can give a pretty good correlation of what people judge. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on intuitive psychology because I think this is more directly relevant to collective intelligence. And I already realized um, I was too ambitious in what I wanted to do, so I'm going to have to cut short a lot of things here. But just to highlight some things that we've done over the last few years um, in using these kind of tools for probabilistic um, generative modeling and inference, there, the, the, the central idea here is now to use, have programs that describe how agents perceive the world based on their state and make plans that then uh, to act in the world that then can change the state of the world. And you know, there's a lot of math behind this, which I'm not gonna go into, but the fundamental equation is this one here, which is I think very familiar to, to all of us, the basic idea of some kind of utility function, which in this form, which Julian Har Edinger, um, who together with Gyo Guan, Laura Schultz and I uh, published a sort of an overview of these ideas a few years ago, um, and called the naive utility calculus, is basically just a, a, um, a way of simple format for utility functions, which assign rewards to states in the world and costs to action. And then says, well, plan agents make plans that are intended to, or that they can foresee as maximizing as, as best they can, the expected rewards minus costs, subject to their beliefs about the world, okay, which can be formulated in probabilistic terms. So just to illustrate like one application of this, which Julian played a role in, uh, but was also the thesis work of Chris Baker. Um, this is what we call our food truck studies, where we're going to watch an agent moving around in space and make an inference about what they want and also what they believe. Um, and and I'm, I'll show you how that, well, we'll, we can do that as a little bit of a demo, but then I'll show you how these models can capture that. All right. Um, so, uh, in this, this is think of this as a view of a uh, university campus. Um, I'm not sure if uh, UCLA is active like this right now, but on many of our campuses in normal times, there are food trucks and people go out and get their lunch from food trucks. And um, in this case, this is a window on campus where there's two parking spots where different trucks could come on different days. On this part of campus, there's three trucks that come on different days, um, Korean, Lebanese, and Mexican, indicated by K, L, and M. But any one truck might come or not come on a different day. Only two can park here at a time. Um, and this particular day, you can see that the Korean truck is down here in the lower left. The Lebanese truck is parked here in the upper right. But Holly, our graduate student, comes out of her office. This is a building. Can only see what's, she only sort of has line of sight perceptual access. So she can see the Korean truck here, but she can't see what's on the other side, although she knows there's a parking lot there. So what does she do? Well, suppose you see her take this sequence of actions. She goes around the corner, where now she can see what's here. But at that point, she turns around and comes back and goes to the Korean truck. So the question is, based on this observed sequence of actions, what does she want? Or let's put it this way, what do you think is her favorite truck? Would you say Korean, Lebanese, or Mexican? Now, um, some people might have the first response Korean, because of course, that's where she wound up. But most people, when they think about it a little bit, say Mexican, which is interesting because the Mexican isn't actually here. But intuitively, you might say, well, how else would you explain why she went out of her way? If Korean was her favorite truck, she would have just gone straight there. But if she was, if she, if Mexican was her preferred food and um, she thought it might possibly be over here, then, uh, then that would explain why she would go to look for it. And only when seeing that it wasn't there, would she come back to what you can also infer is her second favorite truck. So you can infer from this a complete preference order that Mexican is the best, Korean is second for her, and Lebanese is the third. Okay. You can also make an inference about what she believed was possibly here uh, when she came out 
of her office. So you know that she didn't know because if she knew, then she, if she either would have gone there and, and gone all the way to Lebanese, if Lebanese was her favorite, or she would have gone straight here. So you can, first that you can infer that she didn't quite know, but that she thought at least it was possible that Mexican could be there, um, as well as that, um, her, you know, uh, probably more, maybe more likely Mexican than Lebanese or nothing because it couldn't be Korean. And if it was Lebanese or nothing, then why would she go out of her way? So those inferences are captured by these bars here. And what I'm showing you, people's inferences are in red and our model is, is inferences are in blue. And again, what that model is doing is doing a kind of Bayesian inverse planning, working backwards from what you can observe, the world state, the agent state, and the sequence of actions to make inferences about the desires and the beliefs that would lead to this, to this under rational planning, as well as line of sight, rational perception and inference. So the model captures all these aspects of what's going on in agent's mind. And not just in this one situation, but in a number of different situations. So we can vary which trucks are present on different days, the geometry of the environment. And in each case, we can get people's judgments about the degree of preference for these different um, foods, as well as the initial beliefs. And the model fits really remarkably well. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the, here, I'm just, here I'm just showing the same kind of scatter plots I showed before. In many ways, interestingly, I think human, you might think of, and this, this is, to me resonates with some of the themes from Maha's talk, you might think that um, physics is easier than psychology in a sense. <laughs> um, and intuitive physics and intuitive psychology are both things you can model with these probabilistic inference over these simulation programs. But in many ways, people's intuitive psychology is even more quantitatively predictable, which might have to do with the fact that over long periods, you know, at least for these kinds of action situations, humans are either either very close to rational or at least our minds think that they're very rational. So that doing rational probabilistic inference of this basically rational perception and planning model gives a very good account, at least how humans think about what's going on inside the minds of others. Okay, that's all I have to say, or that's all the time I have to say about um, intuitive psychology. I do want to talk a little about program synthesis because I know that uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, Melanie mentioned that it's at the heart there. I'll just advertise one thing I didn't get to talk about, which is recent work that extends this paradigm towards not just single agents, but what maybe is most interesting for collective intelligence. I think many of us are familiar with the famous studies of Hyder and Simmel, which showed how you know, in this, in this classic movie, even just the simple motions of now, not just a single point-like agent moving around in these 2D environments, but a couple of simple shapes can lead to, you know, very compelling um, dramatic tension, as well as sense of like, who's good, who's bad, who might be cooperating, with who are competing with who. And there's really neat work that I'll just advertise again by um, Aviv Netanyahu and Chan Min Shu. Uh, Aviv is a grad student at MIT, Tianmen is a postdoc, in which they built this world called Flatland, which is basically allows them to sort of recreate um, various kinds of Hyder and Simmel like um, animations in a very um, productive generative way. So they built a generative model in this AAAI paper from last year, papers called Phase. They can capture a range of helping and hindering situations. And it's, um, they can, I mean, it's a, really a lot, a lot of hard, complex work that went into being able to build models of how agents might um, perceive the world and model other agents' plans and make their own plans and reaction. Um, their system is able to, you know, basically make, generate um, Hyder and Simmel like animations, which are about as compelling to people as people controlling the same things with the game engine. So check it out. And um, I think it's just showing how we can take this paradigm towards the situations that matter more for understanding how humans understand social and collective intelligence. Um, in, in the last uh, couple of minutes, if, if I mean, again, I may, I, I'm gonna I maybe go over a couple of minutes here, but I wanna talk about where learning comes into the picture, how we can actually learn systems of knowledge. Like you might say, well, how could we learn an intuitive theory of psychology or how could we learn a physics engine, right? If we capture these, as these simulation programs, whether it's you know a physics engine or a, a, a single agent planner or a multi-agent physics grounded planner like was going on in that phase paper, you have an incredibly hard problem here because your knowledge is some kind of a program, a, a complex program. And that means your learning algorithm has to be something like a program learning program, okay? um, a program, a program whose output is another program. 
All right. Um, you could say that like any learning algorithm is like that, like learning in gradient descent in a neural network. Well, you have an algorithm who takes it, which takes as input the network architecture and some data set and returns as output, you know, the trained network, which is, you call that a, pro, a, a program. But because that's a differentiable program and uh, learning, and, and you have a smooth error landscape, learning is, is much more tractable than in arbitrary general symbolic programs like these simulators. So if you want to search in the space of simulation programs, it's a much harder thing. There's not anything like a nice topology or smooth geometry. So this is again where this idea of like learning as programming comes in or the child as hacker. And you know, we think about all the different kinds of, first of all, all the different kinds of knowledge that humans have, not just I'm, I'm not just referring to, you know, these uh, like these kind of core knowledge simulation programs, but I want to talk about learning mechanisms that can both modify and improve these kinds of systems, but also go well beyond them to all the systems of knowledge that humans build individually, collectively. And then I want to say, draw our attention to all the different kinds of activities of coding, if you like, all the ways that we make our program systems better. So that can include tuning parameters um, of an existing chunk of code, like you do when you're training a gradient, uh, uh, neural network with gradient descent, but all these other activities, which involve symbolic operation, like writing a new function or debugging an existing function or writing a new library or even writing a whole new language. And often, uh, you know, I think our most interesting forms of knowledge creation are not just writing one new function, but writing libraries and languages constructing new primitives, which let us write new programs more quickly. And if you want to think about how humans, let's say, grow a system of knowledge like in intuitive physics or other kinds of systems that aren't present at birth, but that we maybe develop culturally, it's building these languages of thought that is key. And I think we can draw analogs from how you might build machines that can build their own programming languages. Now, this is, again, one of these things that AI has dreamed about for a long time, and we're very far from having systems do this. But we've, we've recently started to make some small steps towards this. And I'll just, again, sort of advertise um, one last uh, piece of work by a recent graduate of our lab, Kevin Ellis, who was a brilliant student. He's now a professor at Cornell and is one of the people that works with Melanie that she, she was talking about as part of these efforts to link up abstraction in humans and AI systems. And a key part of Kevin's thesis was this system called Dream Coder, which um, I'll, I'll show, tell you in a second why it's called what, why it's called dream coder, but it used where the dream part comes in. There's a certain kind of wake sleep learning if you're familiar with that. But the key idea is it's a system that is, is domain general. It, in, in this paper, we applied it to eight different uh, domains that are shown here. In each case, it learns to solve problems, individual problems, by writing a little chunk of code. So each problem is solved with, with a, a program. Um, and I'm showing you here a few examples of problems to solve in each of these domains. But the interesting is what happens, the interesting kind of learning, the more, more interesting one is what happens across problems as the system starts off with a very limited language, programming language, that isn't sufficient to solve most of the problems in the domain. Or you could say it is sufficient, like I'll illustrate here for this list function domain, but it's intractable because the programs are way too complicated and they can never be found by any plausible search algorithm. So let's say we're trying to sort lists, okay? and we can write um, a, uh, well, we, you, you can write a list sorting program in various languages, but our, our system here starts off with just some very basic functional programming operators, and it's not able to actually write a compact list sorting function initially. Um, but over time, it solves simpler problems, like, for example, just choose the maximum element of a list, or something even simpler, like um, filter out zeros from the list. Okay? And um, having solved those problems, it abstracts out reusable new primitives such that by the end, after a few iterations of library building, it now can write a very compact um, search, or, or sorry, sorting algorithm. So this is the sorting algorithm that the system comes up with, um, sorting program, um, which isn't the most efficient algorithm, but it makes intuitive sense. And it's a sort of a, a natural intuitive sort program. Um, and it's expressible compactly in the language of thought that the system is built. But if you go back and look at the original uh, programming language that the system starts with, that same program looks like this. It's incredibly long and kind of impenetrable, and you would never have been able to find it with uh, you know, just uh, reasonable search resources. So the system learns to be able to do this 
by, by building two kinds of knowledge. And this is the wake sleep part, which again, I, all I can do is just sort of advertise it. But the system basically, um, the wake phase is what I just illustrated, salt writing code to solve problems. And then these different sleep learning phases, it, it builds abstractions by compressing out motifs that have been found in, in more than one program during its waking time. And then there's the dreaming kind of sleep. We, and here's actually a place where neural network or pattern recognition comes in very usefully. You can think of this as like learning more sort of implicit expertise, whereas the abstraction phase is like learning explicit symbolic domain knowledge. Here, as in other forms of wake sleep learning, the system imagines new problems for itself to solve and then trains a neural network which can guide the search for the symbolic programs during the waking phase. Okay. And, and in a sense, you can think of these two sleep phases as both ways of improved search, one by improving the language and the other by improving how you use it. So um, it, it's, uh, it's a it's very neat system. Um, maybe some of the neatest examples of it are things like kind of graphical problems like building towers or drawing, making simple drawings like these logo drawings. And, and it's maybe easiest to just illustrate what the dreaming does there where, for example, a system starts off with a very simple logo-like language. So it can just like put the pen down or pick it up, go straight and turn. That's pretty much it. Plus um, land abstraction. So <laughs> general recursive functions. Um, but that's not enough to, to draw most of these programs. And initially when the system start, starts out, or sort of over time, it builds a, a rich kind of library, like what, what, what you're seeing here with primitives like spirals and circles, um, other kinds of symmetry operations, all right? Um, but you can really see what it's learned in terms of its dreams. So it's randomly imagined problems to solve. At the beginning of learning, it doesn't really know how to do very much, just put lines down, go straight and turn, or it, you know, iterate a little bit. So its dreams are kind of boring. But after it's built up this library, after 20 outer loop cycles of learning, now it has a lot more interesting dreams because it has a much more interesting language of thought. And I think that might show you something about how the system is able to bootstrap its knowledge. Um, we, we apply this and I think it can be applied to many other sorts of domains. And that's something that, that Kevin and other students are, are working on. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll just wrap up and say, you know, I've, um, slide issue, I lost my mouse, so I can't actually go to my last slide. But, um, so I, I tried to give a roadmap of the way that we in our group have recently been trying to reverse engineer the foundations of human intelligence, both individual and collective intelligence, guided broadly by this developmental philosophy, starting thinking about what kinds of knowledge do we start with and what are the kind of learning procedures that can build beyond that. It's obviously you know, a, only small steps towards the very large goals. Uh, I, I think I have a similar um, humility when I think about uh, where we're going as, as Melanie does, although also a kind of optimism, thinking that you know, we now have a, a toolkit that enables us to get a handle on both the kinds of basic common sense knowledge that we start off with, with these probabilistic programs wrapped around various kinds of rich simulators coming from games and other places where we've really been building great advances in simulation technology, but then also these, these tools of essentially starting to have machines that can write their own programs and learn to write their programs as ways of thinking about how knowledge grows. Okay, so thanks for your attention. I'm sorry to go a little bit over, uh, but I did want to get out a bunch of foundations that I think might be useful for other parts of the workshop.